Hey there, it's Shannon Matchick Myers, and today we're looking at sequences as relates to calculus. So let's start off by considering the function f at x equal to root x. So let's go ahead and graph the function, all right? So I'll make a scale where we can see a bit of the graph. So if we make these two, I think it gets two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. And for the other axis, the f at x axis, we will just make this singles. So making our graph, we'll have an ordered pair at zero, zero, one, one. Be careful, the x axis has uh, each unit is worth two. And then four, two. And then going to nine, we'll be up at three. Good so far. And then making our nice, slowly increasing curve, we've got our f at x. Groovy? Okay, so now we've sketched the graph of the function. Now let's find the following values. So we already found f at zero was zero f at 1 is 1, f at 2 is the square root of 2, and just for the heck of it, let's write this as the square root of 0, the square root of 1, just to get a trend going here. We'll get root 3, root 4, which was 2, and root 5. And let's take a look at the limits, right? So the limit as x approaches 0 of f at x is gonna be, it's a, it would be a one-sided limit because of the domain, right? So that would equal to zero. And actually, let's edit that a little and, and save from the right. And that would equal to zero, root zero, which is zero. The limit as x approaches one from the left and from the right is going to be equal to one root 1, which is 1, and root 4, which is 2, for the x approaching 4 of root x. And then as x increases without bound, and we, you know, so x is going this way, right, without bound, um, what's happening as we trace our graph? Do you see how it's going to increase without bound, albeit slowly, all right, so let's just, I know technically it doesn't exist, but this is like our, our direction it's going is infinity, infinitely up. All right, good so far? Excellent. Now consider a sub n equal to the square root of n. Now we're kind of transitioning, relating our um, function notation to sequence notation. So instead of f at one, it would be a sub one. So a sub 1 is going to be equal to the square root of 1, which was 1. And if we were going to draw on this graph here, we would just have this point right here. And then a sub 2 would be root 2. Well, we don't know exactly what that is, but it's on the graph. We can just draw in that point. A sub 3 is root 3. So again, drawing in this point on the graph, do you see the difference? We're not connecting those dots. So A sub 4 is root 4, which we know is 2. And A sub 5 is root 5. And it would be about here. Groovy? All right, so basically the difference between the graph of a sequence and a function, um, of you know, a continuous function, not just a set of ordered pairs that's a function, is going to be that you just have the domain is your positive integers or non-negative integers. So sometimes we start a sequence at n is zero, and sometimes we start it at n equal to 1, sometimes even a little further to the right. So um, for the one 
bit for this for this sequence here we started it at one right so it looks like f at n is equal to a sub n at all of the positive integers, right? So basically the domain of a sequence is typically the positive integers Sometimes we start at n equal to zero, that's fine. Sometimes we start a little further down the line, we'll, we'll be looking at infinite behavior. And then the range of a sequence, it can be pretty much whatever um, range of a sequence is the all the outputs so all possible outputs given the domain groovy so what the so basically your input of the sequence were what you input here with the in, right? And what we get out is our output. So this one ended up being one, this was just root two. So the whole thing, a sub two is an output and it happens to equal root two. Cool, cool? So the range are the outputs and the domains, the possible inputs, the ends in this case. Groovy? All right, so here we go. We're going to sketch the graph of the sequence. We kind of cheated and not cheated, but we did it up there. Um, I'll do the same scale as we used Prior, but this time instead of x we'll have n and instead of f at x we'll have a sub n. Groovy? Okay, so now we'll graph our sequence. I started it at 1, so we have 1, 1. We have, I'm going to go to um, 4, 2, I'm gonna go to nine, three, so we can kind of get the feel for where we're gonna be at each of these integers. And it would just continue on in this manner. Cool, cool? All right, so looking at the two graphs we sketched as n approaches infinity, what does it look like? It looks like a sub n is, a, is also approaching infinity. So we would say that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n does not exist since it increases without bound. Thus, a sub n diverges. Cool so far? All right, so let's take a look at a little bit of how to just you know, some of the basics of sequences. Let's write the first five terms of each of these sequences. One of them is regular and one of them is recursive. 
meaning that we use earlier terms to find a current term. So for the first one, let's go ahead and check it out. The first term would be a sub one, that will equal to three times one over one plus four. So I'm just plugging in a one wherever there was an n, and then I'll get my output. So that will end up being three-fifths. Good so far? All right, if you want, go ahead and pause the video, get the rest of the terms, um, or you can work with me. All right, you got this. A sub two will be three times two over two plus four, which will be six over six, which is one. A sub three is three times three over three plus four, which will be nine sevenths. A sub four is three times four over four plus four, which will be 12 eighths, which reduces to three halves. So really just like finding function values at the positive integers. So the last term that we're finding is the fifth term. So three times five over five plus four, which will be 15 over nine, which reduces to five thirds. Groovy? Awesome. All right, so we would represent these terms of our sequence, okay? So the outputs are the terms of the sequence, right? So we can write them as, as a list. It doesn't even have to be ordered. And usually we're putting them in set notation. So we've got three fifths, one nine sevenths, three halves, and five thirds. Good so far? Okay, so the tricky part, right, is that sometimes, you know, we reduce these fractions or these expressions or terms, and um, so it, it's hard to see a trend. So it can be really hard to find the nth term of a sequence. And just remember that the terms of the sequence were the outputs. So A1 had an output of 3 fifths, A2, 6 six, which was 1, etc. So these guys here are called the terms in yellow. Groovy? Okay, so moving right along. Let's take a look at this recursive sequence. So we need the term from before in order to find the next term. So the bonus here is we already have the first term, which is super awesome. So now we just need to take a look at how to find this second term. So we wanna write it in terms of something plus one. So a sub two will be a sub one plus one. So k is one in this case. And that will equal to one third times a sub one squared. Well, what was a one? A one was, sorry, a one was six. That was given. And we'll be squaring it. So one third times 36 will give us 12. Good so far? All right. So this one, a little bit different. To find that second term, we had to do a little bit of different type of work. We're using, we're using this K, all right? And 
a prior term. And so we plugged in a sub one to find the second term. Next time we'll have to plug in a sub two, right? And, and so on and so forth. So a sub three will be a sub two plus one, which is one third times a sub two squared, which will be one third times 12 squared, which is one third times 144, which gives us 48. Cool, cool? Actually, we don't need to box these. We'll put them on a list or a set. All right, so again, we're taking our K and plugging it in, and then we're putting in that prior term. I don't know if we'll have enough colors for that, but this was the prior term, and we got that from over here. All right, we'll probably have to get a calculator out pretty soon. A4 will be A sub three plus one, which is one third times A three squared, which is one third times 48 squared, which will be 768. And then the fifth term of the sequence will be a sub four plus one, which is one third times a sub four squared, which is one third times 768 squared, which will be 196,608. And I'll just go through and kind of highlight what we plugged in. And that one. And now we'll go ahead and present our sequence, the first five terms of our sequence. So the sequence would go on, but we were just asked for the first five terms. So we'll put 12, 48. Actually, what did I miss? The easy one, right? 6, 12, 48, 768 and 196,608. And we're good to go. Cool, cool? Excellent. All right, now determining whether a sequence converges or diverges. So here, we already did one of these, all right, but here's the official definition of the limit of a sequence. Let L be a real number. The limit of a sequence, A sub N, is L, written as the limit as N approaches infinity of A sub N equal to L, if for some epsilon greater than zero, there exists an M greater than zero such that the distance between the nth term and the limit is less than epsilon whenever some n is greater, whenever n is greater than m. If the limit L exists, sorry, there's a typo, then the sequence converges. If the limit does not exist, then the sequence diverges. So if we take a look at just, just a couple of uh, 
graphs here. You go to mode and then you want to be in sequence. And so that's over here, done. And then your y equal is gonna look a little bit different, all right? So now we're gonna do, we're gonna graph what we had just done. So remember how we did a sub n equal to root n? So we'll go second square root and then our symbol and then graph. If you're, if you're in your y equal and you're on the app I'm using, you can actually pick your color and the lighter the color, the easier it'll be to see the graph. So I'll hit graph. And what we're looking at here is the infinite behavior. So hopefully you can see as we, you know, go on and on and on and on, you see all the little dots, right? Kind of cool. Um, what, what's happening is our graph is increasing without bound as we'd seen. So it would be considered to be a divergent sequence. Kind of groovy, huh? All right. I'll go ahead and paste that here. And the bounds, the bounds were, or the notation, remember, is n and a sub n for your axes. And then in this case, our a sub n was equal to root n. Cool, cool. So that is an example of something that is unbounded and um, diverges. Now let's take a look at something else that would diverge, or not diverge, would, would converge. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going into y equals again, and we'll go, we'll take a look at an alternating sequence. So if you had negative one, and you're raising that to the n, do you see how you'll alternate? And then we'll divide that by n. <clears throat> and let's take a look at this graph and see what happens to it. And as you see, that infinite behavior, it does, it starts out kind of wide apart, right? But then as fairly quickly, you'll see that it goes to zero, right? And so this one converges and its limit is zero. And so again, you have n and a sub n for your axis label. And in this case, our a sub n was equal to negative 1 to the n over n. And so it just dances around um, an output of 0. So first one is an example of a divergent sequence. And as we saw... The limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n was infinity. And then here, this is an example of a convergent sequence. And the limit as n approaches infinity of this one here was equal to zero. Cool, cool. So now let's take a look at the theorem limit of a sequence. Let L be a real number. Let F be a function of a real variable such that the limit as X approaches infinity of F at X equals L. If this sequence a, a sub N is a sequence such that F at N is equal to A sub N for every positive integer N, then 
it turns out that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n also is equal to L. So we're making that connection between how the function behaves and how the, the sequence behaves. Okay, so let's see how it works. Finding the limit of a sequence if it exists. So a sub n is equal to 6 plus 2 over n squared, right? If we look at the related function, f at x equal to 6 plus 2 over x squared, would you agree that f at n equals a sub n for all n? I'll say does. And I would say yes, right? And so we know that the limit as x approaches infinity of 6 plus 2 over x squared equals 6 plus 0, which is 6. And so it turns out that the limit as n approaches infinity of 6 plus 2 over n squared will also equal to 6. And what does that mean? That means that the limit is 6 and a sub n equal to 6 plus 2 over n squared converges. Groovy? All right. So similarly, you don't write that every time, obviously, but I thought I'd write it <laughs> that first time just so we could check out how that works with the theorem. So now let's just work on this one. So the limit as n approaches infinity of cosine at 2 over n will be equivalent to cosine evaluated at the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 over n, which will equal to cosine of 0 which is one. So the limit of this sequence is equal to one. And so a sub n equal to cosine at two over n converges. If it has a finite limit, it converges. Now let's look at writing a formula for the nth term of a sequence. Finding the formula for the nth term of a sequence is all about looking for patterns. We often come across factorials as part of the pattern. Factorials are factors which decrease by one. So five factorial, red as five factorial is five with this exclamation mark, that's red as factorial. And that would be five times four times three times two times one, which happens to equal to 120. We will be working with unknown factorials. In general, n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 times 3 times 2 times 1. And since we're in multiplication, 0 factorial is equal to the identity element for multiplication, which is 1. Groovy? Okay, so now let's simplify the ratio of factorials, all right? So the trick here is you figure out how you, instead of doing this all on your calculator, you want to be, because you, you'll have n's instead of numbers, and so you want to figure out what you can start dividing out. So 8 factorial is going to be less than 10 factorial. And so keep the 8 in terms of the factorial. Now 10 factorial, I want to divide out 8 factorial of my 10 factorial. So do you see that if I multiply it by 10 times 9, that's the same as 10 factorial? Are we good with that? 
So 10 factorial is 10 times 9 times 8 factorial. And then what we can do is completely divide out the 8 factorials to be 1, and we end up with 1 over 90. And we're good to go. Groovy? Now, the next expression is the same as the one we just did. Did you see that? Except it doesn't have actual numbers. So what did we do? The one that was smaller we kept as a factorial. Now we want to divide out the n factorials. So what would the next bigger number be? Beautiful, it would be n plus one, and then we need to go one more n plus two. So do you see that's the same as n plus two factorial, okay? And so the n factorials divide out to be one and we'll get one over n plus two times n plus one. Groovy? Excellent, excellent. All right, so now you can't like bring a factorial in to, to like a sum. So you have to figure out an expression for it. So don't be worried if you see a 2n. Um, it's all right, figure out which one's gonna be smaller. Which one do you think? 2n plus two, that quantity factorial, or 2n factorial? Beautiful, the 2n factorial, that quantity factorial will be smaller. So you keep that and leave it alone. Now, start writing these numbers. The first number being multiplied is 2n plus two. The next one down is 2n plus one. The next one after that, there we go. We have our 2n factorial and we don't need to go any further. So we rewrote the top factorial as what you see in that numerator, and now we can divide out the 2n factorials, and we're left with 2n plus two times 2n plus one. And you can just leave it like that. Groovy? Excellent, all right. So now let's find, work on finding the nth term of a sequence. So this term is a one, that's the output when you plug in one. The second one is a two, a three, and it's the whole fraction, a four, a5. Now doesn't that 120 look familiar? So start to know kind of how factorials look. So we did 5 factorial, remember, and it was 120. And so that's kind of going to clue me in that this might be some sort of a factorial. So here's my supposition. My supposition is that a sub n is equal to 1 over n factorial. Now, let's see if it works. A1 would be 1 over 1 factorial, which is 1. A2 would be 1 over 2 factorial, which is 1 over 2 times 1, which is 1 half, and that works out. We're on a roll here. <laughs> A3 is equal to one over three factorial, which is one over three times two times one, which is one six, I think we've got it. A four is one over four factorial, which would be one over four times three times two times one, which is one over 24, and we already noted that five factorial is 120. So we're good, we found the nth term of our sequence. Cool, cool? Okay, so now let's take a look at the next one. 
So again, this one, remember how I said that you can start a sequence at n equal to zero. And the reason I'm saying this is because what I'm looking at is what seem to be powers of two in the denominator. Do you see that? So I'm, I'm going with that this would be a sub zero, a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, a sub four. So my supposition is that a sub n is equal to one half raised to the n. Let's see if it works. A1 is one half raised to the, or sorry, A0 is one half raised to the zero, which is one. A1 would be one half raised to the one, which is one half. A2 is one half squared, which is one over two squared, which is one fourth and so on. Do you see that it seems to work out? I'll go further. A3 is one half cubed, which is one eighth, and we're good to go. So this definitely works out. Does it mean it's the only answer? No. I'm just looking for something that might be kind of the simplest kind of answer. Now, this one's kind of mean. I'm going to go with it in, in a way that might be slightly different than you. A lot of times we want to look at these things in terms of what they would have looked like as factorials prior to being simplified. All right. So here I'm seeing this trend of, of factorials in the denominator, right? And also I'm going to suppose that this is a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, okay? And so let's see what we got going on here. I'm seeing that I've got a 3 factorial in the denominator that was sort of like partially divided out. So I'm looking at, remember that three factorial is three times two times one. Four factorial is four times three times two times one. Do you see the trend? There's a three times four in the second term. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. Six factorial is six times five times four times three times two times one. So, okay, let's check this bad boy out. I'm looking at the first one, a sub one. So n is one. And I've got a three factorial in the denominator, right? And so here's my supposition, a sub n is going to be, I think I'm going to have n plus 2 factorial in the denominator. And a1, that works out, right? Because that would give me 3 factorial in the denominator. Now, if I have n factorial in the numerator, then all of the factorial in the numerator would divide out. Do you see that? That would end up giving me you know, if I divided it out, let's do some side work. We did this earlier, remember, and we got n factorial over n plus 2 times n plus 1 times n factorial, and those factorials divided out. And do you see we get the same thing? So let's check it. Does it work? It works for a1. a1 would be 1 factorial over 1 plus 2 factorial, which is 1 over 3 times 2. a2 would be 
2 factorial over 2 plus 2 factorial, which is 2 factorial over 4 times 3 times 2 factorial. The 2 factorials divide out, and that works out, right? A3 would be 3 factorial over 3 plus 2 factorial, which would be 3 factorial over 5 times 4 times 3 factorial. Cool. See how it's working? So we got it. So knowledge of factorials and numbers raised to powers is a powerful thing. No pun intended. <laughs> All right. So properties of limits of sequences is next up on the list. And if we have the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals l, which is finite, and the limit as n approaches infinity of b sub n equal to k, which is another finite number, then the limit of the sum of the sequences as n approaches infinity is going to sum or difference would be the limit, the sum or difference of the limits, okay? And then the limit as n approaches infinity of a constant times a sub n, c is a constant. I should put that here. C is a constant. Will be c times l. Oh, <laughs> here it is. c is any real number. And the limit is n approaches infinity of the product of those limits would be the or the limit <clears throat> the the limit as n approaches infinity of the product of sequences is the product of the limit of the sequences l k and then the limit as n approaches infinity of the quotient of the sequences is the quotient of the limits, L over K, provided that B sub N is not equal to the zero sequence and that K is not equal to zero. Groovy? Okay, so how it works, determining whether a sequence converges or diverges, all right? We wanna determine the convergence or divergence of the sequence with the given nth term. If the sequence converges, find its limit. So sometimes we need to use a little bit of common sense, okay? So what are we gonna get in the numerator? Awesome, you're either gonna get, so when n, if n is odd, right, our numerator will be what? zero. So the whole thing will be zero, right? If n is even, our numerator is two. Cool so far? Now, regardless of what how that numerator is behaving, if you look at the infinite behavior, n squared in the denominator is getting very, very large. So it doesn't matter if you have zero or two in the numerator, it's going to, the limit is going to approach, is going to go to zero. So the limit as n approaches infinity of one plus negative one to the n over n squared is going to equal to zero because of that n squared in the denominator. We can take a look at the graph, right? So if we go to our y equals, and let's see, I'll just clear it and redo it. So we'll have 1 plus negative 1. divided by n squared, 
and we graph. And you'll see it, it ends up closing out pretty quickly, right? Cool, cool. So we'll go ahead and take a little picture of that. All right, and then we have on this one, A sub N is equal to one plus negative one to the N over N squared. We've got N as this axis and A sub N as the other axis. Groovy? So there we've seen graphically and using our mad knowledge of fractions <laughs> and infinite behavior, we see that the limit of this sequence is going to approach zero as n approaches infinity. Cool, cool. For the next ones, we're going to work this out by using some algebra to mess them up a little so that we can see where our limit goes. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'll go ahead and just simplify prior, all right? So if I divide by the cube root of n, because that is the highest power in that denominator, I will end up with a sub n will equal to 1 over 1 plus 1 over the cube root of n. So now the limit as n approaches infinity of this new and improved expression is going to be equivalent to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over the cube root of n using our properties of limits. And that will equal to 1 over 1 plus 0, which is equal to 1. Cool, cool? And then you can always verify using the graph. All right, so now, again, a little bit of simplifications in order here. So n minus 2 is smaller than n, so we're going to leave n minus 2 in the factorial over n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 factorial. Isn't that nice? The n minus 2 factorials divide out. And so a sub n can be written as 1 over n times n minus 1. And then finding the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n times n minus 1 will be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n times the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n minus 1, both of which will decrease without bound, 0 times 0 which is zero. Groovy? Awesome sauce. Alrighty. So, and then I think, let me make sure I'm answering the questions. I wasn't. So we would say that the limit is zero for the first one, part A. And so since we found a finite limit, A sub N converges. Here, again, we found the finite limit was 1. And so, A sub n 
converges. And over here, again, found a finite limit of zero, and so A sub n converges. Cool, cool? All right, so now we get into something called um, properties of monotonic sequences and bounded sequences. And, you know, this, these definitions are kind of all thrown at us at the very end of the section, but it's, it's something that we use a lot throughout the chapter. So kind of take a moment to soak it in and, um, and check it all out and go back to it if you need to. So the absolute value theorem for the sequence A sub n, if the limit is n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the sequence equals zero, then it turns out the limit as n approaches infinity of the sequence itself is zero, okay? Squeeze theorem for sequences. So if you have two sequences that kind of sandwich another sequence um, and they have the same limit, so we're talking about some a sub n and b sub n, they both have a finite limit of L as n approaches infinity. And there exists some integer capital actually lowercase n, <laughs> such that a sub n is less than or equal to some c sub n, which is less than or equal to b sub n for all n. Then it turns out that the limit as n approaches infinity of c sub n will also equal to L. Cool, cool? So let's see how this squeeze theorem works. We've got this sequence here. C sub n is equal to negative one to the n times one over n factorial. If we look at A sub n is equal to negative one over two to the n, and B sub n is equal to positive one over two to the n, Maybe not right away, but over time, the C sub n, the given um, sequence we're working with, will be in between them. The limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 over 2 to the n is 0. And the limit as n approaches infinity of positive 1 over 2 to the n is equal to 0 because those denominators increase without bound, okay? So what'll happen is this. Let's just take a look at these. We'll do it graphically as well, but let's just take a look at, you know, term by term what happens. So A1 is gonna equal to negative one over two to the one, which is negative one half, right? B sub one will equal to positive one half, and C sub one is gonna to equal to negative one to the one, it stays negative, and then one over one factorial is one. So you'll have negative one. So it's not in between the A, the A sub n yet. But as we go on, A sub two will be negative one over two squared, which is negative a quarter. B sub two will be positive a quarter and c sub two will be equal to, now it'll be positive, the negative will square away. One over two factorial is one half. So still not in between those values, but getting closer. A three is gonna be negative one over two cubed, which is negative an eighth. B three will be positive one eighth. And c three will be negative one over three factorial, three times two is six. So do you see how we're getting close? Excellent. Now, let's take a look at the next one. A four will be negative 
1 over 16, B4 will be 1 16, and C4 will be 1 over 6 factorial, which is 1 over 24. Now it's going in between those two values. So looking at this, just kind of using our own table that we made, we'll do one more just to show you, but this will give us 1 over 32 for A5. B5 will be positive 1 over 32. And C5 is going to be 1 over 120. Cool so far? Okay. So it turns out that by the squeeze theorem, C sub n, the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n times one over n factorial also equals zero. Cool, cool? One over two raised to the n. And then we'll do the positive one over two raised to the n. We're starting at one. And then we'll do our C sub n, which was negative 1 raised to the n divided by n factorial will be under math, probability, and... Let me put the symbol in again, and then I'll delete this one out. And then um, I'm gonna change those colors around a bit. And then this one, do kind of, is it pink? Okay, so let's see what we've got going on. So when we graph, we will have it's really kind of cool to see. Here we go. You can so we we can see how they don't start out by being in between each other, but as time goes on, they end up uh, sandwiching in that one. All right, so next up, we're at monotonic sequences, all right? So a sequence, A sub n, is monotonic when its terms are non-decreasing. So basically, that means that you can ha have them equal to each other. So instead of saying that it's increasing, <laughs> It's non-decreasing because A1 could be greater than or equal to A2, which in turn could be greater than or equal to A3. And you keep going till you get to A sub N and it keeps trending. Or when its terms are non-increasing, which would mean that A1 could be less than or equal to A2, less than or equal to A3, less than or equal dot, 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 less than or equal to a n, and continuing. And a bounded sequence, a sequence a sub n, is bounded above when there is some real number, m, such that a sub n is less than or equal to this m for all n. The number m is called an upper bound of the sequence. Now a sequence a sub n is bounded below when there's some real number capital N 
such that capital N is less than A sub N, less than or equal, sorry, my bad, for all N, the number N is called a lower bound of the sequence. Now a sequence A sub N is bounded when it is bounded above and below. Bounded above and bounded below. Now, here, here's the kind of big deal. If a sequence A sub N is bounded and monotonic, It converges. Cool? So let's take a look at this next example to see if this sequence is monotonic and whether it's bounded. So here we go. Um, with this one, you want to kind of again, let's play around with that numerator. Recall that negative 1 is less than or equal to cosine it in less than or equal to one. So your numerator is gonna vary between negative one and one, right? As n goes to infinity, whereas the denominator is gonna increase without bound. Okay, so I entered this graph in a couple of times and for some reason, the very first value is not correct. It, it should be like negative 0.54, but the other ones are fine, right? Um, so yeah, so I'm not sure like what's happening there, but you can see over time here that the behavior of this graph Let's see what this value is at. That's at n is 2. It's saying that n is 1, has an output of 1, but that should be like 0.54 or something. Um, but the rest of them look good. <laughs> so we'll take a look at this, at this graph. And um, what you can see is that you do have a bound from above and a bound from below. We'll take a picture and then work with this picture. Okay, so as you can see from as you can see from the graph, right? You're bounded above um I'm going to I'm going to enter this one in. It was it was acting funny. It's supposed to be about neg when when uh when n is 1, it, it should be about negative point five four ish but it was being weird and it was saying it was one so I'm going to put that one in but do you see that you've got this bound above right up here so we're bounded above at about negative 0.54 and we're bounded below here so you've got the the bounding going and so now we just have to look is it monotonic right so bounded yes okay so a sub n is bounded so now we want to look is a sub n monotonic well a1 is greater than or equal to a2 but that is not greater than or equal to a three. So it's not going to be monotonic, but not monotonic. Okay. And so that's kind of a, a visual way to take a look, but as you can see, as in, you know, as you go, as n increases without bound, it the the sequence does converge to zero, right?
it has a limit of zero. Cool, cool? Okay, so there we go. I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you're watching this show. And if you like what I'm doing, hey, hit that subscribe button, that like button, and maybe share the video. Bye. Bye.